Audiobook of Contrasting Identities, Navigating Identity Politics Conversations. Chapter 4, Universal Humanism, Empathy, Special Relationships and Group Identity. Universal Humanism, Empathy, Special Relationships and Group Identity. In current popular media, a regular complaint against what is described as IP is that it divides us that it forces us into competing tribes and undermines the ability for us to see ourselves by our similarities rather than by our differences. This complaint, I argue, is grounded in the desire for universal humanism. Universal humanism is a form of moral humanism some will claim places our moral thought on the basis that we should view each other, first and foremost, as fellow human beings. All other aspects of ourselves, such as our nationality, ethnicity, gender, and so on, always come second to the fact that we are human. From this belief, a favouring of individualism over collectivism also follows. This is because if the fact that we are human always takes priority over any other form of group membership, then speaking of any kind of other collective group would be at odds with hum universal humanism. This is if it's to be understood in this way. Indeed, Jordan Peterson, ABC Q&A 2019, has made such an argument against IP, where he said, The problem is with assuming that the fundamental way you should categorise people is with their group identity. Obviously, we all belong to groups. The issue is whether or not the individual identity is primary and the group identity is secondary, or the group identity is primary and the individual identity is secondary. If you are a proponent, for example, equality of outcome, quotas, then you de facto accept the proposition that is the group identity that is primary and there are all sorts of dangers that are associated with that that far outweigh whatever good you're likely to do. On the face of it, it seems like an attractive idea. Who wouldn't like to break down all our differences and see ourselves as fellow human beings, with no further prejudice clouding our ethical considerations? Such goals have been attempted by Peter Singer with his Expanding Circle, 1981. Singer's Expanding Circle is the observation that, over time, our moral considerations have expanded beyond family members and tribes to other human beings. Singer believes we should expand the circle to humans halfway around the world and to non-human animals. Singer, 1981, assists us with achieving the expanding circle with a thought experiment involving us as an impartial observer, which is an entity that takes on all the suffering in the world. It is from that perspective Caring about all humans and non-human animals suffering equally becomes the obvious goal. A powerful objection to this thought experiment comes from Bernard Williams in his essay, The Human Prejudice. Williams says, 2009, that in such a situation, it would be such a horrible circumstance for us, we would destroy the planet as soon as possible. Imagine right now you felt the suffering of every animal that exists and ever has existed. The degree of suffering would be a million times greater than experiencing the torture of every person who was hung, drawn and quartered. So, Williams concludes, it is a matter of both our humanity and our sanity to have some partiality in our ethical considerations and not treat all humans and non-human animals equally. This is why Williams says that if we were to act as if we were experiencing this, we would end all life as soon as possible. Williams grounds our justification for our partiality for human beings over non-human animals on the basis that if we were to hear that an African American and a Caucasian were in danger, and we prioritise saving the Caucasian on, the ba on that basis alone, we would be forced to justify it with a reason. And in the past, this was attempted with racist pseudoscience, 
claiming that African Americans were biologically inferior to causation uh, to Caucasians. Such attempts to justify the prejudice assumes that a justification is required. Just saying because he's white is not enough. However, if we were to prioritise saving a human being over a non-human animal, we do not require any further be reason beyond it's a human being. To force this point, imagine this amended version of the trolley problem, a famous thought experiment put forward by Philippa Foote. There are two runaway trolleys on two separate tracks. On one track there is a puppy and on the other is an un a newborn human baby. There is a button you can press that can stop one of the trolleys, but only one, not both. Which trolley do you stop? The one with the human baby or the one with the puppy? If you chose the one with the baby and gave the reason, it's a human being. This would be seen by most as enough of a reason. Whereas, if one track instead had a white baby and the other had a black baby, and you chose the white baby because it's white, then no one would grant that as enough of a reason. Indeed, most of us would be repulsed by such a reason. Williams's argument was based on preferencing humans over non-human animals in our ethical thought. However, this can also be applied to different human beings. Consider our family members. If it is true that universal humanism says that our ethical thought should treat all human beings equally, regardless of group membership, then when we preference the safety and well-being of our immediate family members over strangers, if we are to place the fact that we are human beings before any kind of group membership, then we are guilty of nothing more than a prejudice. A similar argument was made by Julian Savlescu in his book Human Enhancement, where he says, 2009, that the prejudice of family membership is based on biology. But this cannot be right. There are many families based on adoption, step families and blended families that harbour the same prejudice. What drives the partiality here is not biology, but the existence of special relationships. And this is what this understanding of universal humanism misses, the entirely human attribute of having a special relationship with those near and dear to us. Returning to our amended trolley problem, say each track has a human baby, but one of them is your child. If you chose to stop the child, your child's trolley, doing this on the basis that it is your child would be seen by most as enough of a reason. To dismiss or condemn this as a prejudice would seem quite bizarre. Some may argue that this is something we need to grow out of as human beings and be done with any prejudice once and for all, that this is merely tribalism. But the issue of Singer's impartial observer also applies within groups of human beings. Imagine right now if you put all human beings equally in your moral thought and your empathy as each of your closest relatives and friends. Your knowledge that all those other humans around the world suffering and dying would indeed drive you to insanity. Imagine for a moment that right now all your loved ones and friends have suffered and died. The grief would be astronomical. As it is to preference our empathy and ethical thought for humans over non-human animals for the sake of our sanity. So too must we preference those humans we have special relationships with over strangers who are halfway around the world. It is a mistake to conclude from this that we should give non-human animals and humans who we do not have special relationships with no ethical consideration at all. It is also part of our humanity to express compassion, charity, and to seek justice for those who do not have it. However, special relationships must be included in our understanding of universal humanism. But what does all of this have to do with IP? Let's return to the criterion one of what counts as IP. Groups who have a shared experience which is grounded in their identity. The term shared experiences is of great importance here. 
What drives the group membership in IP is the special relationship members of that group have through the shared experience of a perceived injustice and oppression. And this is consistent with our, how our empathy works as human beings. If I had suffered in some specific way, such as a war veteran with PTSD, other war veterans will be able to be more empathetic than civilians. It would make more sense a war veteran saying, I understand how you feel, than if it was said by a civilian. IP critics may object that this is too essentialist. They may say that even within groups, experiences will differ, thus making a case for individualism. This is certainly true, but this is something that has already been addressed through intersectional IP. The experiences of a working class African American woman will be significantly different than the experiences of a middle class Caucasian woman. The war veteran will still have much more of an ability to empathise with another war veteran suffering than a civilian, even though there will be more nuanced differences of the experiences between the two war veterans. Hence, intersectional IP allows the ability to acknowledge the shared experiences in one aspect of our identity, whilst also acknowledge the differences on other aspects of our identity. This is how IP is perfectly consistent with universal moral humanism. We can consistently acknowledge that one acknowledge one another as fellow human beings and empathize with one another through that part of our identity. However, we can also acknowledge the special relationships we have through our shared experiences, which we can allow greater empathy with and need to as a part of being human. One may object that this would legitimise what is sometimes called white identity politics, white nationalism, or white supremacy. Sam Harris has in fact mentioned, D. Kilmer 2017, that the identity politics he hates the most is white identity politics. This involves a fundamental error when we consider the correct application of IP. Returning to the criteria of IP, IP is when the shared experiences involved a perceived injustice. It does not include advocating for supremacy based on that identity group. Hence, advocacy for white IP would need to demonstrate how, based on their whiteness, they are the disproportionate victims of injustice, disadvantage or oppression. The reason for identity groups based on race and gender are not simply because she's a woman, or because he's black. The reason is because there is a shared experience of disadvantage or oppression, which is a result of being black or being a woman. As mentioned earlier, acknowledgement of the preference of disadvantage or oppression to your group does not entail complete dismissal or no acknowledgement of disadvantage or oppression of other groups since it is also part of our human outlook to have concern for others. However, to allocate equal footing to every level of disadvantage and oppression would be so demanding it would lead us to insanity. Imagine that every time you mention suffering that you're experiencing, resulted with people dismissively giving the answer, someone out there has had it worse, Unless your circumstances are extremely horrible, this statement would be true. However, the truth of this statement does nothing to delegitimize your own suffering. Perspective is sometimes helpful, but to consider all suffering equally would demand us to constantly dismiss our own suffering. This is the kind of insanity that a universal humanism, which doesn't include special relationships, would impose on us. Hence, appealing to our universal humanity must include our partiality based on special relationships. And regarding the shared experiences of disadvantage and oppression, it is hard to imagine this not qualifying as a special relationship.